As we talked about a little bit on the Zoom call last week, but really what you saw in the documentary film that you watched, The Pruitt and Igo Myth, in the second half of the, the 20th century, so from the post-World War II years on to the 2000s, uh, our society became divided. Our cities, our metropolitan areas became divided between poor or failing cities and, and affluent, uh, emerging and wealthy suburbs. As we learned in the uh, film, The Pruitt and Igo Myth, that city suburb divide between poor cities and wealthy suburbs also was a racial divide. Uh, African-Americans were largely restricted to rental markets and inner city communities uh, that opened up as cities began to empty. Uh, suburban residential markets that were pretty new in the, in the post-World War II years opened initially to only uh, white Americans. And, and they were open to white Americans from all class backgrounds. There wasn't so much a, a class restriction as there was a racial one. Th these phenomena created a uniquely American and a racialized geography in the post-World War II years in cities across our country. Sometimes this is characterized as chocolate cities and vanilla suburbs. The period from about 1970 to the end of the 1990s is, is another period that historians refer to as the, the urban crisis. Um, so during that period, again, this is still post-World War II, but we're talking not really the 50s and 60s, but really starting to emerge in the 70s, cities are, are failing. They've, they've lost uh, millions in population. They've lost, uh, many cities have lost their financial and industrial base. And the rates of social problems plaguing cities is at, at an all-time high. Things like violent crime and, and drug use, for instance, are starting to plague cities. So, so this, there's this period uh, in the late 1900s that, that uh, again, is characterized by failing cities in, in affluent and wealthy suburbs. Uh, this raises the question, or it raised the question for a lot of historians, a lot of uh, policymakers and sociologists who were around at this time, is, is what happening to our cities, specifically the inner city neighborhoods in the US, a matter of economics, or is it more a matter of race and, and racism? Uh, and so this week, you'll be introduced to, to really two different uh, takes on that question. And William Julius Wilson, uh, who's one of the co-authors of the first essay, and Massey and Denton are two sociologists that are three sociologists that, that were uh, literally in debate with each other from about the late 1970s to uh, the mid 1990s about this question. And they, they kind of represent two different uh, bodies of thought or theoretical explanations for why we see the failing cities and specifically why is there this like racial component to urban decline. So the first perspective comes from uh, a Harvard sociologist, William Julius Wilson, uh, who at the time of, of, of writing, most of his, his work on the urban crisis was at the University of Chicago. And uh, his co-author is Loic Waquant. Uh, Loic Waquant is a French sociologist who um, studied under Wilson at the University of Chicago, and they have uh, co-authored uh, a few pieces together. But Wilson, William Julius Wilson. Uh, so Waquant and Wilson are the, the authors of the first essay, but I have Waquant's name in, in parentheses because really uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about is, is Wilson's uh, theoretical framework that, that you'll see a little bit in the essay, but um, there's a lot of contributions Wilson made to urban sociology that, that he can be credited for even without Waquant. The second uh, essay is, is currently the most accepted theory on urban inequality in sociology. And it comes from uh, two sociologists named uh, Doug Massey and Nancy Denton. Uh, 
they were, again, writing in direct response to Wilson. So their work both builds on, but also directly challenges Wilson's theory. And, and they kind of argue that segregation, uh, housing segregation by race, perpetuates economic inequality between racial groups that explains a lot of the patterns that we ended up seeing um, in cities at the turn of the century. So what I have here in front of you is just a summary slide. I'm going to walk us through each of these uh, each of these arguments in the in the lesson today, starting with with Wilson first, and then again we'll break uh, after talking about Wilson and Laquant, and then we'll uh, we'll get into uh, talking about Massey and Denton and their contributions next. Okay, let me pop up all of this here. So the first essay comes from, again, William Julius Wilson and Louis Laquant. Um, Wilson has published several articles, uh, but three really um, influential books, one in 1978, one in 1987, and the other in 1994, that focus on this post-World War II, but really post-civil rights era urban decline. And um, his books are called the Declining Significance of Race, When Work Disappears, and The Truly Disadvantaged are these three like award-winning books um, that, that are seminal um, in this kind of conversation about why did cities decline so bad and why did it seem to be characterized uh, by failing Black neighborhoods spe specifically. Um, so, Wilson uh, basically offers a, a structural economic argument. Um, he says that geographic, geographically concentrated poverty, which we saw a little bit in Pruitt and Igo, right? Like when middle-class residents begin to leave the city, who's left behind? It's the poorest of the poor um, are, are what Wilson calls the underclass. Um, and for Wilson, concentrated poverty and the development of an urban underclass is the result of structural changes in the economy combined with an exodus of middle class and even working class people from inner city neighborhoods. Um, the fact that middle class people left the, left the inner city is made worse, according to Wilson, because of growing uh, occupational polarization since the 1970s. Um, so since the 1970s, you begin to see a rise in high paid jobs um, in, a, in, in, a, in sort of like the service sector or like white collar jobs. And you start to see a decline in, in manufacturing jobs, many of them which would employ people who lived in inner city neighborhoods. Um, so according to the, the essay that you'll read, people in concentrated poverty neighborhoods, so neighborhoods with high levels of concentrated poverty, what Wilson calls the urban underclass, exhibit higher rates of uh, long-term joblessness, out-of-wedlock birth, school dropout, crime and criminality, and victimization from crime, uh, in general social disorder, and uh, lower than average wages than people who live outside of um, inner city failing communities or kind of what Wilson um, what we see in Pruitt I go developing and what Wilson kind of characterizes as the second American uh, ghetto. And so for Wilson, urban inequality, uh, ghettoization of African Americans in a failing inner city, uh, specifically in the in the in the second half of the 1900s, is really about the timing of structural changes. Uh, for Wilson, it's sort of a, a perfect storm of sorts. Um, on the slide here, I have a timeline that I created that, that, that kind of captures this perfect storm. Um, now, some of, these, uh, some of these events we've talked about this semester already. So industrialization, the, the period of industrialization um, and, its, and its overlap or, or um, the, the, its role in determining mass urbanization, we've talked about this semester. In other words, we talked about how part of the reason that 
mass urbanization occurred, part of the reason that Americans became a predominantly urban or city population is because of industrial forces that pulled us to the city, specifically manufacturing, um, industrial manufacturing as a, as a main source of employment that replaced uh, agriculture and farming, right? So the line in green we've talked about this semester, and we've kind of looked at that history. We've even talked about this line in orange here. Um, the period of mass urbanization, I think historians would probably argue that it that it went from you know the end of the 1800s to into today, like we're still urbanizing. Um, I I kind of split mass urbanization into two lines. And, and this, perp, the, you know, from World War, the end of World War II on, I changed it to say mass suburbanization. Now, um, after watching Pruitt and Igo, you, you kind of already know what that means. Um, but at first, Americans began to move to cities. But as cities began to become overcrowded and housing uh, opportunities opened up, outside of the cities or on the fringe of cities, we start to see, uh, and transportation technologies improve, we start to see more Americans suburbanize. So not just leaving rural areas for cities, but also leaving for areas around, very close to cities uh, in the surrounding suburbs. So, so really there's, there's two pieces on this timeline that we really haven't talked about quite yet. The urban crisis, which I which I mentioned briefly, and in blue here, the Great Migration. All of these all of these uh, events end up uh, creating the structural conditions that make the the perfect storm that Wilson is talking about. And I'll kind of I'll kind of uh, walk us through um, each of these, um, and, and 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 I'll end by focusing on the Great Migration because that's that's the piece that that is new for us, and it's also really central to, to why Wilson thinks what happened to cities um, specifically uh, or, or maybe had the worst or most peculiar outcomes for, for Black Americans. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the different pieces of this timeline. So the fir first thing, this is a recap. We talked about industrialization. So the period of industrialization, uh, and, and mass urbanization represents this movement of, of Americans from, from rural areas into urban areas. An urban area, again, is going to include the central city, but also the neighborhoods and suburbs uh, directly surrounding the central city and what we call the, the, the greater, uh, so sort of the greater Boston area or the Boston metropolitan area would include the city of Boston and all the suburbs. So this, this graph, uh, this trend is just, it's, it's factual. Americans um, are still um, on this upward trend more likely to be a, a population residing in a city or a suburb than in a rural area. So this is mass urbanization. Included in this is, is, the, is the suburbanization of Americans. Now, now, we talked a lot about industrial manufacturing, factory jobs, um, as being the one of the major pool factors that brought Americans into cities and, and helped shape uh, urban development patterns. Well, many of you have, have probably heard the term de-industrialization, and, and this is sort of captured, um, an example of that is captured on this graph here. So if factory jobs replaced farming jobs, um, eventually, eventually, as a society, we shifted away from industrial manufacturing uh, towards something else. And, and some people say that uh, our, uh, the truth is our economy is just much more diverse than it was. Uh, but some people say that the dominant economic form is not industrial manufacturing anymore, but uh, technology or the service sector is sort of where the most Americans will find employment. And those jobs, uh, especially low wage jobs in the service sector, think customer service jobs, uh, don't give you the same type of wages that uh, working at the, the, at the Ford factory would have 70 years ago. So on the graph here, uh, which is using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's showing uh, what 
what historians refer to as deindustrialization. Um, and, and look at the years on this map. It starts in 1950. So we're talking, uh, at, you know, World War II is over and uh, America is still growing as a nation. But the main good job to be had um, is starting to go away. Now, uh, we don't have time to get into sort of all of the, the, the determinants of this trend, but part of it is, is technological advancements in manufacturing, right? You just need less people to do the type of jobs as robots and, and computers improve. Um, uh, also, there's, there's some explanations that globalization and global trade patterns shifted uh, some, you know, a lot of us here talks about factories closing and going abroad or off, offshoring their work. Um, so again, we don't have time to, to really unpack all of the determinants of this, but what we're seeing on this graph here is that there is this downward trend in manufacturing employment that is shaping the second half of the 1900s. Um, and, and because a lot of the manufacturing jobs were located in cities or re really close to cities, uh, cities became poorer. Here's a map from uh, from Milwaukee, from the city of Milwaukee, um, and it shows that particular neighborhoods went into steep economic decline between 1970 on the left and uh, 2010 on the right. And this is based on um, U.S. Census data. And so if, if you know, I don't know how many of you have ever, ever been to Milwaukee. I've actually never been to Milwaukee, but we can we can see we can see a lot um, in in a map like this. So on the on the left we have the city of Milwaukee, and the darker the color, um, the higher the the percentage of of people living in poverty or below the poverty line are. And so it's it's you know there's a there seems to be a small inner city and, and low income population that's noticeable in the map in 1970. By 2010, urban poverty exploded. So, so the, the, this map is kind of capturing that urban crisis that, that I mentioned earlier. Part of the urban crisis is, you know, from if, you know, if you ask a criminal justice professor, they'd say the urban crisis was high rates of crime and and disorder and violence, right? If you ask a social worker, they would say the 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 urban crisis had to do with with family dissolution and 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 what happens when when uh, you lock up all the men in in a neighborhood, right? Uh, but the the rising amounts and sort of the 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 sprawling nature of the poverty in inner city Milwaukee is also something um, th that is a type of crisis, right? If, you, if, if, if the majority of your population is low income, right? That is gonna have some cascading effects on the, the future development of that space and on the lived experience of, of everyone in, in those spaces as well. Which brings us to the last kind of variable that Wilson talks about and, and again, this, this doesn't come up in, in your essay, but I'm, I'm again sharing kind of over all the articles and three books Wilson uh, wrote about this topic, um, kind of what variables did he point out to explain uh, what's happening. So at the same time as cities were declining rapidly, African-Americans were still moving to cities at high rates. Uh, this wave of Black city migration is referred to by historians as the great migration. And I have some graphics that, that illustrate the intensity and geographic patterns of, of, this, of this migration. So here's the, first, here's the first graphic that kind of shows the great migration. So in, in 100 years from 1900 to the year 2000, um, you can kind of see the, the change in intensity uh, by looking at the size of these, these bars um, in the graph here. So in 1900, the gray, this, the, this largest uh, section here in gray is, is, is the amount of uh, black people living in the rural South. So in the South, outside of cities. Um, 
and the yellow is is in in the south, but in cities, right? So this very small dark gray line, uh, which which might be a few percentages, and this other uh, sort of light blue line represent the amount of Af African Americans in 1900 living in northern cities or northern places, cities or outside of cities. Uh, so this this statistic came up last week um, when we were talking about segregation in the South versus the North, and I mentioned that that um, while while in the North there wasn't uh, Jim Crow segregation, uh, there was still examples of discrimination in the North, but there there just wasn't a lot of Black Americans who lived outside of the South um, at the time that Du Bois was writing either. Um, this this shifts. In 100 years, this is only showing us a snapshot of two years, but this kind of shows us the Great Migration. 100 years later, um, you see a sizable increase in the amount of uh, uh, Black Americans living in the non-South, so out West, in the North, in the Midwest, um, and also urbanized in the South. So this, this graphic is showing us both the Great Migration, the movement out of uh, from the South to the non-South, but also urbanization. So African-Americans go from 70, around 75%, um, or, or yeah, around 75% rural as a population to over 85% non-rural or urban uh, in just a hundred years. So this graphic is showing us the urbanization patterns or timing of urbanization specifically for, for Black Americans. Um, here's another graphic that, that, that kind of shows us uh, that same movement. Um, now we're looking at percentages of African American, uh, of the African American population living in the American South. Uh, so this is, uh, do you live in, in uh, a region considered the South, regardless of if you're in a city or outside of a city? And, and again, in 1790, uh, which is when we conducted our first census. Um, and it's still during uh, the period of American slavery, right? Uh, African Americans are 90, over 90% 90 a Southern population. Um, slavery ends around here, but still uh, African Americans largely a Southern population. And then right around here, 1910, we start to see the beginning of the Great Migration and this downward slope uh, between 1910 and, and 1970 really represent what historians call the Great Migration. Here's a map version of the same of that same data. This is looking at uh, of the of those two line charts that showed us 1900 and in, in the year 2000. This is the uh, kind of the what you can see in this map is the concentration of African Americans in, in Southern states. Now, um, it's, it's not a logical leap to, to deduce that this is a direct result of, of American slavery, right? Which was clustered, also clustered in the South in, in these sort of regions highlighted here. Um, this is 60 years later, so not the exact same data as the previous chart, but um, <clears throat> in 60 years, uh, this map, looks a little different and we start to see the effects of the Great Migration. Large clustering in Southern California and like Los Angeles and the Oakland, California region up here. Um, you know, there, there's of course that these large splotches are actually cities um, in these different states. So, you know, Houston um, up here in Ohio is, is Cleveland and, and, and this is Dayton and Cincinnati and Columbus. And these are all, you know, Pittsburgh and, and Philly, or, or sorry, uh, Philly's over here. This might be, uh, actually, I don't know what this is, maybe Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Anyway, Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Gary, Indiana, uh, uh, cities that, that really never registered as having uh, uh, a large Black population begin to uh, see this influx in Black migration. Um, during this period called the Great Migration. Uh, at, you know, again, African Americans went from living in the rural South almost exclusively um, at the end of the Civil War to an urban 
population spread across cities in the South, in the West, in the Midwest, um, and in and, and some East Coast cities as well. Now, um, this is the part of the of the of this first part of the lecture that um, I I think I'm going to end with, but it's it's a uh, it's not going to be a quick kind of story to walk through. Although I want to try to walk us through as quickly as possible. Um, so the Great Migration is is this period between around 1910 and around 1970 that uh, millions, uh, over six million African Americans left the rural South and became an urban people, basically, um, and and left and even people who stayed in the South moved, you know, from rural Georgia to urban Atlanta. Let's say, for example. Um, so one of the questions is that that not that Wilson doesn't really um, answer, but historians have and so sociologists have sort of asked this question is like why why did the Great Migration happen when it happened? The consequences of the Great Migration are what Wilson talks about, uh, sort of this perfect storm of of African Americans arriving to the city almost just as opportunity is starting to pick up and leave. Um, but there's also a question of like, why, why did the great migration ever occur to begin with? And so there's a few um, kind of general explanations. And on the slide here, I have a, a, a matrix that kind of uh, walks us through a, a popular argument for why the timing of the great migration happened when it happened. Um, but there's a few things that, that, I, that I think uh, are generally true. So in general, there there is a declining, there, there's declining opportunities in agriculture. And that's true for, for African Americans, but for all Americans, right? That's part of the, the trend that, 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 that's part of the industrialization trend, right? Less jobs in farming, more jobs in, in a factory. Um, specifically, uh, plaguing the Black population is there's, you know, racism and discrimination in, in the South and in blatant forms of exclusion and inequality in the South that, that may have been part of the, a push factor maybe. Um, as industrialization kind of picks up, there's, there's a large demand for people in, in factory work, right? So again, this, this pool of industrialization to, to, to go to a city to find opportunity. Um, and then, and then opportunities that used to be kind of exclusive to the South, uh, sort of Northern, uh, as the sort of migration went on, opportunities in the North and cities outside of the South began to seem uh, more inviting, right? And welcoming to, to, to African-Americans looking for opportunity. But, but those are some general things that are true. But just to tell you kind of what's going on in this chart that, I that I'm sharing with you, there's basically, well, anytime you get a chart, you should read the label. So there's a, there's, this says the timing and intensity of great migration as a function of push and pull factors and constraints on migration. So on the title alone, what this, what this graphic is trying to tell us is what, what might have pushed, push factors and pull factors, what would have pushed someone to migrate? What would have pulled them? What would have incentivized them to migrate? Um, and then and then constraints, meaning like what is happening in the world that that would make a push or a pull factor kind of what would give it more weight, right? Because in our life, we're always kind of experiencing push and pull factors when we're making decisions. And what's going to give one of those more weight than the other one? So let me uh, do my best to quickly uh, summarize this this chart. And, and then uh, if you read the, the, the labels of the columns, you kind of get a sense of, of what's happening in the chart. So there's a time period. The second column is going to look at the change in constraints over time. Again, changing constraints that might make a push or a pull factor more uh, way more on your behavior. Uh, what are a, a list of potential push factors and pull factors? Um, and then the list of constraints and, and whether or not 
um, and how intense the level of migration was around this time period. So the first uh, time period is 1700 to, to, the, to the Civil War. Um, and, and, and so basically what this, what this chart is, what this table is also showing us is like, like in theory is if slavery was so bad, why didn't like African-Americans should have been left the South? Like why didn't, why didn't as a, as a, either as individuals or as a people, why didn't, why didn't they pack up and leave sooner? Okay. So, so during this first time period, 1700 to 1861, um, a major push factor to get out of the South is slavery, right? It's terrible. And a major pull factor is, is the promise of freedom uh, outside of the South. Uh, major constraints that would have prevented any movement, uh, massive movement, is there's no property rights. If you are not a white man at this time, uh, you can't own property. Uh, if you don't own property, you can't claim citizenship. Uh, you can't, you know, start a business. You can't do a lot of stuff. So, um, so, so as, as I hope you all know that that um, during American slavery, you know, black people were not considered to be fully human, right, and and not granted the rights of citizenship in this country. So that was a, that's a huge constraint. No one, no one can leave under those conditions. Also, even with the promise of freedom in the North, there's no promise of opportunity in the North, right? There's, there's no industry in the North that, that's welcoming uh, to, to, to African-Americans. So, so no, or very low levels of migration during this period. Of course, we, we, we hear stories of the Underground Railroad. We hear stories of people escaping bondage. Um, but in general, not a massive movement outside of the South. So then, the, then we have the uh, the next period is 1861 to 1875. This period both captures the Civil War, um, which ends in the emancipation of of enslaved uh, Africans, and it captures the period that's called Radical Reconstruction, which is this brief period after the Civil War where where uh, Northern soldiers occupied the South, where um, it, it, uh, newly freed um, uh, Black Americans were elected, were allowed to vote, and many were elected to um, political office. It was this really progressive sort of very brief period uh, where, where the US was sort of punishing the South for seceding, right? and. And so what's happening, what's happening in terms of push and pull factors around uh, the end of the Civil War, the period of radical reconstruction? Major amounts of poverty in the South, right? Just had a Civil War, uh, infrastructure was completely decimated, uh, jobs, you could forget about it. There's high rates of poverty in the South at this time. That would be, you would think, would be a major thing that would push people out. In terms of pull factors, now, now we're entering the period of early industrialization. Now we're starting to see uh, the, you know, the garment factories and, and you know, the steel factories and things like that begin to open up. In terms of a constraint that, that sometimes people reference, like why, well, why during this, like as soon as the civil rights, the civil war, excuse me, was over, why didn't, uh, uh, formerly enslaved Africans leave the South? What, what was the point of staying? Um, again, this was the period of radical reconstruction. I'd encourage you to Google it if you've never heard about it, was, was this really a, a progressive period in the South where, where I, and I think it was a window of opportunity where we could have sort of completely not solved the, the crimes of slavery, but we could have improved race relations um, you, you know, there, there was talks of, of, uh, on the, on the chart here, it says the promise of 40 acres and a mule. If you've ever heard that before, this was a real life promise. This was, this was restitution, right? For the crimes of slavery. There was this promise that, um, you know, African-Americans would get a plot of land and they would get a mule. And, and, and that was a huge deal. You have to remember this is before, massive urbanization, massive industrialization. And, and like probably like most of us today, if someone offered you an opportunity to stay right where you live, but you could have your own land and build your own house, 
and, and, and have your own farm, uh, that would be appealing to a lot of people because sure, they might've heard about a place called Milwaukee or a place called Boston, but that's so foreign. Uh, I'd, I'd rather just stay here. Anyway, we also see almost no or very low levels of, of, of Black people leaving the South at this time. The next uh, period of, of uh, time that's listed on this table is 1875 to 1917. So uh, radical reconstruction, this period where, where we were going to atone for our, our sins of slavery, we were going to offer some restitution to formerly enslaved people, um, that ends. And we see this, this um, ushering in of, of Jim Crow, of the Jim Crow law and Jim Crow segregation in the South. So that's a major push factor, right? Whites only, black only drinking fountains, um, sort of hostile social interactions still high levels of poverty, that would all be, be push factors that would, that would cause people to wanna to leave the South. There's still these new jobs and there's still uh, this promise of freedom. Now it's just, I don't have to deal with Jim Crow and in these kind of hostile environments in the South, I can, I can go up North. Um, we still see very low levels of, of migration. This is the great migration did not start during this period. And the question is, in terms of why, uh, we can point to some constraints like there's a high demand now for, um, for workers in, in southern industry, specifically agriculture and farming, ironically enough. So a lot of African Americans ended up um, working on farms at, in, in a, what are called share, sharecropper uh, circumstances, where, where they got paid lowly wages and, and essentially effectively ended up being uh, a legalized form of, of slavery or indentured servitude. Um, and so the Jim Crow segregation, the Jim Crow system in the South was, it was violent. Um, it was, and it was coercive uh, toward, towards African, towards African Americans. For instance, um, there's, a, there was a lot of places in the South that uh, didn't get the news, right? They, they didn't share the news that, that slaves had been eman emancipated right away. Uh, this, so there was a lot of coercive stuff that happened. Um, and another way of saying that is everyone wasn't in the know um, in terms of Black people in the South didn't realize that there was something like that this wasn't all that life had to offer, right? Um, we're, we're sort of brainwashed by, the, by, by life in the South. Now we see this, the first sort of wave of the Great Migration in this next uh, line down. 1917 to 1929. And there's some changes that are happening in the world. One, uh, World War I is happening. And then there's also this thing called the uh, boll weevil infestation that decimated uh, crops and farms in America. Um, so all of a sudden, the, the, the great jobs to be had in, in agriculture um, are questionable because of, of, of the boll weevil infestation. And we need men to to, to, go to, to go to war. Um, there's still Jim Crow in the South. There's still poverty, especially for African-Americans in the South. There's freedom and jobs still in the North. Um, we see the great migration begin to pick up in this time. And the only real explanation is that the, 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 the high demand for black workers on, in agriculture in the South begins to go away because of the, the boll weevil um, infestation. Um, 19, this this uh, second to last line, 1929 to 1944. Um, so if the Great Migration starts in the 1910s, 1920s, it almost like pauses or flatlines during the during the Great Depression years. So um, and and the Great Depression is is the main explanation there. So uh, the boll weevil infestation is resolved. So we, we need people, uh, and World War II, I is over. So we need people working in agriculture and farming. And um, that was a main source of employment for African-Americans in the South. So the, there's still a high Southern demand. But now all of the opportunity in the North is completely wrecked by the economic depression. Um, so the factory jobs and the promise of a good life in the North just just uh, pauses. 
Now, this last line, um, this period between 1944 and 1970 is when we see the, the highest surge of Black people leaving the South and moving to cities, 1944 to 1970. Uh, a couple things happen. So World War II um, ends. Um, and and I'll, this will come up in a little bit how World War II is influential here. But also there's an invention of, of something that changes agriculture and farming uh, tremendously. So the, the invention of the mechanical cotton picker meant that you don't need as much people uh, to work in, in agriculture, especially in that industry. Um, and so there's still Jim Crow, because uh, this is before the civil rights era. Um, there's still high rates of poverty in the South, but now the jobs and the promise of freedom in the North come back and and uh, there's a sort of question mark in this constraints box because at this point in American history, there really is not, there's not a lot stopping. There's a lot that would make you not want to be in the South, right? Things are starting to get really violent in the South um, in terms of race relations, uh, uh, in terms of the KKK and lynch mobs. So there's a lot of reasons to get out of the South. And there's not a lot of reasons not to try something in the north. Plus, at this point, you've had, you know, maybe a maybe a relative, or maybe somebody else in your family, maybe a neighbor you remember from Alabama. Now, now you heard, you know, they live up the way in Cincinnati. Maybe I'll go check that out. Um, so we see this huge wave of of African Americans leaving the South, uh, leaving. Not, not all leaving the South, you know, because still about 50% live in a city in the South, but leaving the rural South and going towards cities and leaving the South and then others leaving the South and going out West to California or um, Washington or going to the East Coast or Midwestern cities. So that, that, that's kind of a, um, again, that's not Wilson's theoretical explanation for why why the Great Migration happened when it did, but that's an explanation for why we see the timing that we see. And in that, in the that last piece, the 1944 to 1970 is when the greatest wave of, of Black urbanization occurs. And that's also the period leading right up into what is called the urban crisis. So, <clears throat> so again, according to Wilson, this is all uh, just a, a, a like a perfect storm. Black people just happened to arrive at the inner city uh, at a time when cities were restructuring uh, and restructuring economically. So opportunity was leaving the city and people who, were, who wanted opportunity were following that opportunity. Or sometimes people left the city first and the jobs followed um, the affluent and middle-class residents to the suburbs. Uh, what you see in the, the essay this week by Wilson and Vaquant is this perfect storm has direct and negative impacts on black city neighborhoods and the, and the people living in them. Um, it results in what's called a spatial and skills mismatch. <clears throat> if you, um, you know, if you're a farmer and you move to uh, take a job in a, you know, you know, a, a pig slaughterhouse in Chicago, and it's 1910, you don't need a high, you don't need a college, you don't need a high school degree, uh, you don't need a particular set of skills at the slaughterhouse, like they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out, they'll throw you in there. What happened by, <clears throat> by the time, you know, a lot of black, uh, sizable black population arrived to cities, uh, many of them arrived unskilled, just like the migrants who arrived in the immigrants who arrived from Europe, you know, you know, at Ellis Island in the 1910s, right? African Americans arriving to cities in the 1960s are now coming from, let's say, rural Alabama, and I'm moving to Detroit, Michigan, hoping to get the factory job. But the spatial and the skills mismatch means you move to inner city Detroit, but guess what? The, the factory is in Dearborn, Michigan, which is, which is a suburb. And, um, and so there, there was a spatial mismatch, meaning that 
that you live in a place where you can't find a job. And, and it's also sometimes called a skills mismatch because the, there might have been jobs to be had in inner city Detroit in 1970, but they weren't they weren't good jobs, right? Or they weren't the type, or maybe they were great jobs. Maybe inner city Detroit had a lot of jobs in finance, but um, a newly arrived uh, African migrant who was a farmer, right, is not going to qualify for that kind of job. So there's high rates of joblessness also uh, is, is one of these consequences, uh, high rates of joblessness. Um, so unemployment and joblessness is, is, uh, are similar terms. Um, unemployment means maybe you're looking for a job, but you can't find one. Joblessness means there's no jobs to be had, right? It means there's high levels of unemployment. Also, there, there's just not work, right? Uh, so one of Wilson's books is called When Work Disappears. A family dissolution becomes a major problem uh, during this period. Uh, it starts to be a rise in, in single, single mother-headed households, especially in, in the inner city, especially in the, uh, poor Black communities. And, um, in the, and so Wilson talks a, a lot about the breakdown of the family structure and how that has sociological implications. Um, People who live in these communities also end up uh, feeling socially isolated. You saw a lot of that in the Pruitt and Igo myth, right? You can imagine if you moved to a, a large scale project housing unit um, and you, you moved, you know, you moved to St. Louis or you moved to Milwaukee uh, for looking for opportunity, but you don't really have family there. And when you get there, you didn't, you don't, you know, you're a stranger and think about all of the things we talked about earlier this semester about how city life can be so uh, jolting in some ways for people who, who come from small towns uh, because you're overwhelmed with the sights and the sounds and the strangers. And, um, and, and then if you throw in there high levels of distrust, you know, people don't trust their neighbors because there's high levels of crime. People don't trust maybe the police. Um, it, people living in these conditions end up being socially is isolated as well. And then deviance becomes a, a major focus for Wilson. Um, and that's a thread that especially uh, those of you who are uh, CJ majors might decide to talk about in your, um, as you creatively connect this to other things, but um, um, uh, deviance in the form of crime and criminality, but also, also, uh, delinquency, right? Kids skipping school, also uh, drug use, for instance, other forms of deviance as well. All of this, all of these negative social problems that have emerged from uh, inner city, predominantly Black communities in the 1970s to the 2000s, uh, according to Wilson, and it's well documented in, in a lot of his work and, and others who have both critiqued and added to it, for Wilson, this is largely an issue of economics, um, with race being being sort of a second issue in terms of importance to class. Um, for, for, for Wilson, it really is a, a perfect storm type of situation. He has a book that he titled <laughs> The Declining Significance of Race. And for Wilson, it's not that race doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not that he, thinks racism wasn't impacting the, the Black American experience. Wilson more so made the argument that, uh, that we sort of see in that, in that table about the Great Migration, that as racism went from really violent and, and terribly exclusive and oppressive slavery to more, to more equitable forms, right? We got rid of slavery. Eventually, we got rid of Jim Crow. Right, so for Wilson, he sees that as an as American, as a society, America is becoming is placing less significance on on race, um, and so for him, the outcomes that we see in inner cities is really about class and economics. Because according to Wilson, who again he Wilson is a black man, he is a University of Chicago professor. According to Wilson. Uh, the civil rights era brought a lot of advances that allowed certain black people um, to, to uh, achieve upward mobility and to become middle class. 
to get a college degree, to become a professor of the University of Chicago. And so for him, it wasn't, it wasn't a black, uh, it wasn't that black people were experiencing these terrible urban outcomes. It was that, it was that um, black families that recently migrated to cities who moved to poor inner city neighborhoods, like the, that was the specifically, what, what he calls the urban underclass is a specific swath of the black population that really got the short end of the stick that really we ought to be thinking about and focus our policy and concerns on. Um, and, and, and that's what that's what I mean by it. For Wilson, it's more about class and specifically poverty than it is about uh, white, black, Latino, than it is about race. <laughs>